in practice, you're going to see a lot of animals that have liver issues. And it usually starts because on blood work, you notice that liver enzymes are abnormal. And so then you say, oh, there's liver disease. But you can always be more specific than that. So how we're actually going to approach this is to approach it in a stepwise fashion. And so first we look at enzymes, and that's what this lecture is going to cover. Uh, and then this divides up into leakage enzymes, so we're only going to talk leakage enzymes. And then the other ones are called induced enzymes. So that'll be uh, kind of the next day's lecture. After that, we're going to talk bilirubin, and you have a, a leg up in this because we've already talked about bilirubin previously, so we're going to revisit it. Um, the next lecture is going to be on uh, indirect liver function tests. So I should actually say that this was really one and two, and then bilirubin is lecture three, and then lecture four is going to be on liver function. So we're going to talk about both uh, liver indirect indirect liver function tests and direct liver function tests. So today we're going to focus on leakage enzymes. And so when you assess the liver, you can talk about what the enzymes are doing. You can talk about whether or not there's cholestasis and if the liver is failing or if it's functioning okay. The phrase liver disease isn't very specific, and so we want to avoid that and be as specific as possible because that's going to dictate how we actually approach our patient and what our differentials are. I also include in the notes the damnit v scheme. Um, again, this is, you know, you have to start building your differential repertoire now, and so we're going to practice this when we do the cases, but I'm not actually going to go over it now. So it's in the notes, and I think you should familiarize yourself with sort of possibilities, and it's not all inclusive of what can happen, what bad things especially can happen to the liver. So a lot of cells in the body have enzymes. We already talked about creatine kinase and a little bit about AST. And these enzymes that live in the body, they catalyze a variety of reactions. And that is not the point of this. You don't have to know any of those. What you do have to know is that we measure these enzymes in serum to let us know or to tell us what's going on in the body. So there's a normal amount of a lot of these enzymes present already. Um, and so what we're looking for are increases in this. And so what we're detecting is actually a chemical reaction, and so that means that you have to handle the sample to not destroy the activity of the enzyme or else it won't work. Um, and so we're only going to interpret elevations in enzymes. Decreases in enzymes are not relevant. A few things also to realize is that enzymes have limited roles, so sometimes disease will be present without enzymes being increased. Um, also, at end-stage liver disease may not have increases in enzymes because the hepatocytes have actually stopped working. So again, we're going to start by talking about leakage enzymes. And these mean, I'm going to make my hepatocyte cell brown. It kind of looks like a big fried egg and then has a purple nucleus in there. And so cytosolic enzymes are leakage enzymes. And so that means they live in the cytoplasm. And I'm using ALT as my example. So it's, they're free within the cell cytoplasm. And any time that the cell undergoes any sort of damage, let's say, right? So it, you've lost kind of your integrity of your cell. So that's maybe the cell has kind of died. Actually, we'll just put an X there. So the cell has died. And so now what happens is tons of the enzyme actually leaked out. You can also have just injury. And we'll make this guy kind of wiggly because he's sad because he got injured. And so in that case, you can also have ALT leak out. How much enzyme actually comes out is going to be the factor of the severity of the damage and the numbers of cells affected. I think you know me by now to know that I'm never going to ask you that because we're only going to interpret things. But it's important to know that if you have tons and tons and tons of dying cells, you're going to have a really high increase 
versus a small increase with only a few cells with mild injury. So now let's actually talk specific enzymes. All right, so these are the three leakage enzymes. There are other leakage enzymes in the body, but we're only talking liver. We already talked about CK. So ALT, remember the L stands for liver, doesn't really, but this guy's very liver specific, but he's only liver specific in dogs and cats. So if you see increases in ALT, you want to think liver. AST, we already talked about this. This is liver and it's muscle. All species. What does that mean? If it's increased and you don't have anything else, you don't have a CK in a large animal, and if you don't have an ALT in a small animal, you won't know what it is. So you need to look at other things. If CK is increased, that would support muscle in any species. If ALT is increased, that would support liver, of course. And so you have to kind of look at the company that it keeps and keep it in mind. Of course, you can have both diseases or both things actually going on. SDH is very, very, very specific um, for liver. And since we don't have a great liver-specific enzyme in large animals, we use it in large animals. The problem is it has a huge sample handling issue, meaning that it has to be run within an hour or so of collection. So it's not a great test for submitting out and sending anywhere. And I list in the notes sort of a kind of how to evaluate AST and ALT increases. We're going to mostly focus on ALT and, and AST. We're not going to really focus on SDH very much. And again, we only look at increases. We don't look at decreases. And increases mean either injury or death to cells. The next lecture, which is not for Monday, we'll talk about induced enzymes, and those are a little bit different and have a different set of differentials. So let's just quickly talk about a few things that bad things that can happen to the liver. And again, this is listed in your notes, so I'm going to just sort of go over them to give you some ideas. So, um, so a big one I have to say is trauma. And one of the cases, your pre-class case, is a dog that was hit by a car. Um, we've always talked about it in terms of anemia. But now we're going to talk about it in terms of what happens to the inside of the body. So an animal being hit by a car, that's very traumatic, and that could happen, um, certainly causing liver disease. Another, and I'm going opposite in the damnit V scheme, but another potentially would be um, tr uh, excuse me, toxins um, or drugs. And so, of course, it's under... T, so toxins, and we see this a lot in veterinary medicine. So maybe it wasn't a drug that we gave the animal, or maybe it's a drug that they got into. So you have to always get a really good history and see what that was. The eyes are a really big one. So infectious, and that's why I'm going backwards because it's more, it's kind of more in order of what we see. So infectious. Uh, and non-infectious inflammatory processes, very big deal. These can start in the liver or they can drain disease in the intestine and you can see that. Uh, neoplasia, certainly we can see it. Um, although sometimes neoplasia, and this can be metastatic or primary, you may or may not see um, abnormalities. Metabolic causes include fat accumulation with lipidosis, uh, you can certainly see any sort of endocrine disorder can cause fat accumulation, and so that's a possibility. Some of the other causes, anomalous like portosystemic shunts, actually rarely cause liver enzyme changes, um, and so that's listed, although it's, it's really just more under bad things that can happen to the liver. And the degenerative shock, um, blood flow, severe anemia, heat stroke, I mentioned those before, all of those, especially the central lobule area, is going to be very, very um, sensitive. 